Mr. Huss, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to have a great conversation about your experience during World War II and maybe a little bit of time after that. All right, so let me introduce myself. My name is Ron Bohan. Uh, I'm a volunteer here at the Morton Museum of Collegeville History, for, specifically for this project. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, would you mind stating your full name um, and your uh, date of birth and place of birth? Okay. Um, the name is Raymond F. Hust, H-U-S-T. I was born in Meridian, Mississippi, and uh, I'll be 92 later this month. That's awesome, 92. Well, yeah. congratulations on that. So today is November 1st, yes. uh, 2014. Mm -hmm. And let's see if I've hit all the, the hot spots here. All right, so very good. Um, so we have your, uh, uh, your name, your date of birth, and what, what branch of service did you serve in, sir? Of the Air Force. The Air Force. Eighth Air Force. Now, back then, was it called the Air Force? Well, when I volunteered, uh, they were just organizing the 8th Air Force in England. I didn't realize it until re reading about it later on, but uh, yes, I was part of the organization of getting started to do bombing on the continent. Oh. So this was the first daytime bombing. Excellent. And so you mentioned you volunteered. Yes. So tell me a little bit about, more about mm. that. So what were you doing right before you decided to volunteer? And then... And then okay. how did that come about? Well, in Meridian, I uh, worked at the railroad as an apprentice carpenter, and I'd always wanted to be a machinist, and saw an advertisement to come up here to Whitehaven, Tennessee, uh -huh. to go to school and be under civil service as an machi aircraft machinist. Well, I came up here and spent six months, and was here during Bar Pearl Harbor. So if you can recall that, where were you when you heard the news about Pearl Harbor and then what was your feelings and how did the community react? It was a Sunday morning and I was living with another family here in, in Whitehaven and we were all laying around on the floor reading the paper and listening to the news and it was quite a shock. And I had a young friend that was living with me had come up here too and he immediately said, I'm volunteering tomorrow. And he did. And he did. What service did he go into? I think he went in the army. In the army. Yeah. And uh, but he made it through, as I did. And uh, so that's great. So then, after you got out of mis uh, machinist school here in yeah. Whitehaven, then what then did you do? I, then I went to Mobile, and uh, has worked as a machinist for about a year. And then they uh, let us know that they, we had deferments, being working for the government at that right. time. And uh, they wanted to organize this base in England. And a bunch of us said, okay, hey, let's do it. Let's do it. So we all volunteered to go to England and uh, we volunteered, signed in and got six weeks of basic in San Antonio, Texas. And we're in the middle of the Atlantic the next week. Well, that's the next week. Yes. <laughs> so how did you, do you remember the ship's name that took you to England? Yes, I went on Queen Elizabeth. Did you really? Yes, it had just been converted. And the strange thing about that, all the troops were going over in convoy at that time through the North Atlantic. Well, we didn't go in convoy because we were so big and so fast that a submarine, as I understand it, at that time could not zero in on us in less than nine minutes. So we zigzagged all the way across the Atlantic. Every seven minutes they changed course. Well, fascinating. And, uh, so tell me, had you been on a ship before that point? No, that was my first time. And what is, what is your recollection about the trip over, the voyage? What was it like to be on a ship for the first time? Well, heading to there were six of us in a single cabin, and they stacked the cabins, the bunks, so you couldn't turn over. You couldn't turn over? No, you had to get out and turn over and get back in if you wanted to turn over. And we slept in that bunk one night, and the next night we slept on deck. Out under the stars? Yes. So, uh, but the trip took five days. Five days. Now, how, how did you feel emotionally about that? I mean, were you apprehensive? Were you excited? What were mm -hmm. your, can you feel, remember what your feelings mm -hmm. were? As best I can recall, we just kind of took it in stride, you know, and didn't worry too much about anything. 
What did you do to pass the time on the ship? That's a good question. Not too much that I recall. Just waiting to get on shore? <laughs> yeah, just waiting to, to get it because there were so many of us, there wasn't a lot you could do. But, but I do recall what the meals were like. Tell me about that. We ate twice a day. They had apricots and boiled eggs. And that was it. Twice a day? <laughs> just those two yeah, eggs? those two items, yeah. So on the fifth day, was it hard to finish a meal? Uh, no, we look, kind of looked forward to that. Sure did. That's fascinating. Yeah. Apricots and boiled eggs. Yes. <laughs> that is a weird combination. <laughs> it was easy to serve, I guess, was the, the idea. Yeah. Now, when you uh, have you eaten apricots since, or did you have your fill? Oh, yeah, it was fine. Yeah. No problem. Very good. Or boiled eggs either. <laughs> so tell me a little bit more about uh, mm -hmm. when you got to England, what were your responsibilities there? Well, we uh, set up a machine shop. There was a machine shop there on the base. We were at Warrington, England. That's between Liverpool and Manchester. And the British were operating that base. And they had a, a nice machine shop. And we gradually took over when the British would go to tea time. When they came back, they'd find us on the machine. And that we gradually phased them out and took over the entire thing. So how many men uh, were in that mas machine shop? I mean, what was the size of it? I guess we had a hundred probably. And we had all, fa all kinds of machines, yes. Well, I'm very interested in that. I mean, so what kind of things were you working on? Were you working on aircraft and aircraft parts? We were, we were making parts primarily. They'd bring in a blueprint and a chunk of metal and say, make this. For the aircraft? Yes, or anything else that might need it. So I, I did a little bit of research and in, in, um, the 8th Air Force, I think, did you mostly work on like the B-17 and the B-24 Mustangs? Well, we, uh, we actually didn't work on the plane itself, mm -hmm. but we, we fixed the parts. But our main base was overhauling the engines. And we had about 15 test blocks that were going all the time. So that was the, the main function of that base. The engines? Yes. So would that include <clears throat> engines that were damaged in battle? Uh, well, or need to be uh, reconditioned after a certain number of hours. Right. And, and maybe dam damaged too. And so how, um, what, how, what was your work day like? Was it long hours or did they keep a pretty good schedule? What was it, that like? It was pretty much like being in, in uh, Mobile, really. We worked eight hours a day and got the weekends off, except when we had D-Day. Then we worked 12 hours a day seven days a week. Leading up to D-Day? Yes. So tell me more about that. Did you suspect that uh, something large was yep. underway? Yes, we knew something was coming. We just didn't know exactly when. What were the rumors? Can you recall what you guys speculated? Or? Uh, no, that they were going to cross the channel and make that next move and uh, we would help all we could. Yeah. Um, and were were there a lot of air raids or other worries about spies or, um, you know, like wartime situations that you guys were well, always aware of? Or tell me more about kind of what was that we, about? We, I can only recall we had one alert on our base, and that was just for oh, a week or two. They issued everybody rifles, and uh, after that they took them all back. So, but otherwise... We did, uh, we'd hear the buzz bombs occasionally, and they would be flying over. As long as you could hear them, you didn't worry. But so, when they quit, that's when you started looking for a hole. Why is that? Because they were coming down. Oh, when the yeah. engine stopped? Yes, on the buzz bomb. What was they it like? Uh, I mean, the buzz bombs were um, like ahead of their time in the yeah. sense of rocket prepared, propelled mm -hmm. um, bombs. What was it like being a, a, a young man from, uh, from Alabama, Mississippi? Mississippi. Mississippi, <clears throat> seeing something like that. Mm, I guess we just kind of took it in stride, you know? Didn't get too excited about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's really neat. Um, so, 
Tell me about um, your time off. So you, you would work and then you would have some time off. So what would you do as a young man in England? Well, we, uh, we'd catch a train, go to Manchester, or we'd go to Liverpool. We all learned to ice skate, which was unusual, and of course dance. That was one big thing about England was dance halls. And you could always go to there. And, and the Red Cross was real active. Tell me more about that. What well, is that? They, they were available, had sleeping quarters there, and had food. So pretty much anything you wanted, and you could get tickets to any show that was available. Mm -hmm. So the food, was it um, American fare or English fare? It was American. Mm -hmm. And was that a big treat? Uh, well, it was pretty much what we were getting at the base. Mm -hmm. I see. Wasn't a lot of difference. So tell me about the dance halls. What was that like? With the, Were there English young ladies there? And oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. quite, a, quite a few. And... Uh, and the music was pretty much like America, a lot of American music, and uh, we all enjoyed it. It was an afternoon and also an evening session, so you could spend the day there. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. How was um, uh, how did the locals treat <clears throat> the American <throat> servicemen over in their area? I found it to be great. I never had any complaints about the English people, and got to know one or two families exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. How, how did you meet them? Ice skating. Really? Met a young lady, and uh, she invited me to go home to dinner. And I met the family, and uh, they just adopted me. So every weekend from then on, they expected to see me at the house. Really? And we'd go what a ice treat. skating. Yeah. What a treat. And one of the exciting things that I, I think about a lot of times, that we never had fresh eggs at the base. We always had powdered eggs, and sometimes they were green. But uh, we, I was running the bowling alley after the war was over, before I could come back home. And in it, England? In England, and, in it, and it was located in the mess hall. So I got to know all the cooks. Oh, uh, good. <laughs> so one weekend, with the fresh eggs, I got about four dozen fresh eggs, wrapped each one in a sheet of paper, and put it in my jacket pocket, my overcoat pocket, and every other pocket I could find. Took hey, each a, egg you wrapped yes, up? Yes, and, and went, caught a truck to the train station, <laughs> rode to Liverpool, caught the trolley out to the house and never broke an egg. Never broke an never egg? Never broke an egg, and, and got in the house and I said, walked in, I said, how about get me a bowl? And they said, what do you need for the bowl? I said, oh, just get me a bowl. And they set a bowl on the table, and I started pulling those eggs out one at a time, and it was worth every bit of the trouble. What were their what were their <clears> expressions <throat> and reactions to that? Oh, just fantastic! They just stood there with the mouth open. And the uh, first thing the dad did was go make a cake. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. The dad made the cake. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, but they were they were fine folks, and uh, I guess one of the main things that took a lot of my time was that they decided to have a football team on the base for now american football or yes, english football american football american football yeah and a friend of mine decided we'd go over and try out and uh we got there and the coach looked at us and said take your position and we did and he said okay how about be here tomorrow afternoon and we're going to start practice now, did you play as a young man? I in played in city? high school. In high school? Yeah. So you were you knew what you were doing? Yeah. Uh -huh. And who did you play against over there? We played against other bases. American guys? Mm-hmm. How'd you do? We won every game except one that I can recall in two years' time. Really? Yeah. That and must have been a treat. And we went over to the continent and played one game in La Havre, France, and spent the night in, in Paris. So we all got the chance to see Paris that night That's and caught excellent. the train back, yeah. What was that like for you to I was, step foot on the, it was France It was exciting, I'll have to admit, yeah. But to see La Havre after all the fighting that had taken place, it was nothing but rubble. There wasn't a single building standing. And the football stadium was half gone where we played football. So how did you, so I, I imagine you, you were walking the city and you saw all this devastation? Well, we didn't, we didn't spend any time in the city. It just we came by boat across the channel and we could see everything as we were approaching. 
Uh, what did that make you feel like? I mean, what was oh, that like? You knew they'd had a war then, when you saw all that. So what kind of devastation did you tell me? Let's see, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Everything was flattened. I mean, there wasn't a building standing anywhere. And what were the local people doing, and how were they getting by? I really don't know, because we weren't, didn't have that chance to be exposed to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, how, what boat took you over the channel? One of the Navy boats. Mm -hmm. Was it rough? Was it? No, uh -uh, it wasn't bad, and, and the channel was not very wide there anyway, you know. Right. So, uh, but we went over on a boat and flew back on the B-17. <laughs> Had you been on a B-17 before? Hadn't been on a B-17 before, no. How did that come about? I don't know. They just said get they on the B-17? Yeah, they had took us to the airport. They had one there that didn't have a seat in it. We sat on the floor. <laughs> well, how did you, but, had uh, you ever been in an aircraft before, before that? Uh, no. Don't believe I had. Uh -uh. Were you nervous? I had, mm, well, probably a little bit, I imagine, because that uh, B-17 was kind of shook a little bit, you know, it was kind of, it'd been, like it had been used. It was a little rickety? That. Yes, but we so, made it fine. Now, did you, um, were you frightened about being attacked in the B-17? Like, were the gunner stations being mm -hmm. manned, and did it look uh, like? No, the, the fighting was over at that time. Oh, good. We were just waiting to come back home. Yeah. And uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with they had a, a point system. Yes. And we, being not in combat, we didn't get very, very many points. So it was almost a year before I got back home. I'm glad you brought that up because um, a lot of people don't mm. know about the point mm. system. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that and kind of how did you get points? Uh, the length of service was primarily the thing that we got. For every six months you got a certain number of points. And that was about the only thing we got accumulated points for. But if you were in combat, in battles and what have you, and if you got wounded, uh, you had points all the way around the line. Mm -hmm. And do you recall how many points you needed to come home? No, I don't. Sure don't. Yeah. Is that something you tracked pretty closely, though? No, we didn't. We we were doing fine, and like I said, I was running the bowling alley and meeting this family in Liverpool and uh, ice skating. Why? Just like being home almost, except I was ready to come home to see my future wife. So that was a big thing. I want to touch on that a little bit, but before we leave England, mm -hmm. I'd like to come mm -hmm. back to D Day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And. Um, so how did you learn that D-Day was underway, and, and then what was the excitement or what was the atmosphere like at the base? It, it was apprehensive, and uh, I guess we just we just learned what word of mouth from our lieutenants and officers as to what was going on. Yeah. And but like I say, we knew it was it was coming, so we were prepared. Right. Uh -huh. Wasn't that big a surprise? Right. So, so um, your time in England sounds like you made the best of it, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm I'm glad of that for you. So tell us about mm -hmm. now your time in England is is coming to a close, mm -hmm. and you're going to be heading back. And now, were you on the Queen Mary again coming across? No, I came back on the Navy troop ship, the Miles Standish. The Miles Standish. Yes, and uh, we came back through the North Atlantic again, but it was in March the roughest time of the year for that North Atlantic, they tell me. And we could stand out on the deck and the water was above your head, quite a few feet. And then the water would just drop out the swells, you know, mm -hmm. and the boat would just shake. And you'd wonder how it, how it stayed together. I'd heard that some of these Liberty ships broke half in two. And I wondered why a lot of them didn't break half in two, really because when they'd hit the bottom, it, they must drop 20, 30 feet. Well, as an old yeah. Navy man, <laughs> yeah. you're bringing it right back to me. I know exactly what you're talking about. But we, the, the props were coming out of the water and they were ringing and they just turned it, shut it down for about eight hours and we drifted south. You drifted in, he in heavy seas? Yes. No, With thank no you. no power. <laughs> now, and we stayed in the boat. <laughs> I bet, did you feel seasick? Uh, no, I didn't get seasick, but I found out if you laid flat, it didn't bother you that much. Or it didn't bother me anyway. 
But there were quite a few of them that did, yes. I bet. Uh -huh. mm -hmm, I bet. Well, so it sounds like the uh, Queen Mary might have been a little bit more fun for you. Uh, well, it was kind of crowded. So other than that, yes, it was fine. And to see it, it still had the chandeliers in the, in the, and they had bunks in the, in the swimming pool. It converted it to bunks as well. Really? Yes. <laughs> Amazing. So you mentioned your uh, fiance, and mm -hmm. um, uh, what was her name? Dorothy. Dorothy. Dennis. And mm -hmm. did you end up marrying her? And yes, I did. The uh, strange thing was that we had been going together out of high school. And I told her, I said, well, I volunteered. I'm going over to England, and I'll be gone three years if you want to wait. She said, okay. It was almost three years to the day. And uh, she had moved to Jackson, Mississippi, went to work for Delta Airlines as a ticket agent. And that was the first place I headed for when I got released from Camp Shelby. So what was that moment like when you two saw each other again mm -hmm. after such an extended separation? Uh, unexplainable, really. You just, you just, you had to stop and just stand there for a while and take it all in, you know? Yeah. And duffel bag on my shoulder that I just dropped on the floor, you know? Yeah. And of course, I guess I was a little bit different too. When I went in, I weighed 160 pounds and came out weighing 210. So she said that she sent a boy away and got a man back. Yeah. So I guess that was true. Now, I, I'm picturing this in my mind. You're giving me chills, by the way. So <laughs> she, she was actually at work when you saw her for the first well, time? Well, she came to the bus station mm -hmm. because I took a bus from Shelby over to Jackson. And she was there when I got in. I had called her and told her when I'd be there. And uh, I got fussed at later for not going home to Meridian first. Right. But I went to Jackson and spent a few days and then showed up in Meridian. So Mama was like, okay, they why never, her? They never me? said a word about me de taking that detour. And that was kind of strange. They acted like they didn't even know it. But my sister-in-law kind of chastised me a little bit. She gave you what for? Yes, she did. <laughs> so when, um, when you were in England, um, I, had, I imagine you, you stayed in touch with your family and, your, and Dorothy. Yeah. So what, tell me more about that. How did you guys stay in touch? How did you, uh, how'd you maintain the relationship? We uh, wrote a lot of letters, and uh, she wrote a lot of letters. And, and I had a couple of telephone conversations with her that they had arranged for us. The only bad part of that was it was in the, in the main office there where everybody else was, was the only telephone, you know. No privacy. No right? privacy at all. So that was a little uncomfortable, I'd say, yes. And that was with Dorothy? Yes. Right. And so you got married, and how long have you been married? I'm assuming you're still married, or is uh, Dorothy still well, with us? Well, my wife passed away four years ago. Well, I'm so sorry to hear that, sir. Yeah. We were married 64 years in two days. And she spent the last year in the, in the nursing home. But we, uh, we had lived on the Mississippi Gulf Coast for the last, oh, 30 years. And uh, when Katrina hit, we came up for the weekend. I have a son living in Germantown. Figured to stay a few days. Brought nothing with us, really, except a change of clothes. And didn't go back for, gosh, no how Our house was flooded out. We lost everything. Oh, I'm so sorry but, uh, to hear that. But it wasn't a big deal. We'd been through that before, and we had the kids up here. They said, okay, we're going down to clean up what we can, and y'all decide whether you want to go back or stay here. So we decided to stay here. Wow. And we never made a better decision. This is the finest town I've ever lived in. Well, I we know. love it. We love it. I do, too. Yeah. So the <clears> um, <throat> so you come home, you reunite <clears throat> with Dorothy. Mm-hmm. And um, how was that like to reestablish the relationship with her? Did you guys click right again, right uh, away, right away? We, or? We, we decided that we ought to spend a few months to be sure everything was still the same. So we had the entire summer. And she had told me, she said, I'm not going to marry you unless you go to college. Hell, I just barely got out of high school. But uh, I said, okay. Well, now, had, let me ask you a question about that. All right. So she said, "Yeah, I'm not going to marry you till you got unless you go to college." Yeah. Why did Why did she say that? Because college was not that common in those days. Well, college and, was available to all of us GIs oh, on the GI Bill. Right. 
and she knew that. And uh, so during that summer, I went back and picked up algebra, trig, and physics from high school. And to get made, ready. And made straight A's so I could get into college. First A I've ever made in my life. So I spent one year there at junior college in Meridian and then went to Georgia Tech and graduated from Georgia Tech. Tells you what the love of a good woman can do, right? Oh, absolutely. And she worked for Delta the whole time. A lot of guys, their wives put them through college and then left them afterwards, but there wasn't no way I'd let that gal get away. Good for you. <laughs> well, that makes, me, uh, that makes me smile. So you went to college. So where did you end up going to college? I uh, went to Georgia Tech and, in Atlanta. And were, were there just a lot of GIs in college a, at that time? A ton of us, yeah. yeah. I'd say over half of the students were ex-GIs. And the flunk out rate was extremely small. I bet. Yeah. Because once you've but been it, through a lot of that, college is not so hard. And, and at that time, you didn't have all this uh, qualification to get in college. And anybody that was a resident of Georgia could automatically get into school. So we had a lot of young kids, mm -hmm. and, and I can tell you for sure there was no hazing for the freshmen in college. <laughs> Why is that? Why, well, All of us were ex-GI, oh. the bulk of us. Right, if no you one's messing with you. <laughs> They didn't know what they'd be getting into if they did, you know. Right. <laughs> and we were that much older, too. And what did you study? I studied industrial engineering and industrial management. And so the, um, so what was the post-war days like? I mean, you know, what was the atmosphere or, or do you know what I mean? And, I mean yeah. I, I mean, coming I out of such a country, <clears throat> what was that like? Everything was great. It really was. We lived uh, out at College Park near the airport. My wife, was working downtown and she could walk to the bus stop, get on the bus and ride out to Collierville and walk to the house and never had a worry. And now you think about what's available and it was that way everywhere. We just didn't have any violence at that time and everybody was happy and uh, it was a great situation. Even though we had to study hard and none of us had any money, yeah. So, but we all were in the same boat together and, and made it great. So you got out of college, <clears throat> and eventually you find yourself at Ingalls Shipbuilding down in Pascagoula, Mississippi. Yes, but I, I spent 20 years with Armstrong Tire in Natchez, Mississippi. And what and did you do there? I, I, just about everything, but uh, I was a time study engineer. I wound up uh, in employment, handled all the employment, safety and wound up as industrial relations manager of the plant. We had a thousand employees. And then I left and went to uh, the coast with Ingalls. And that would have been in 69, and Hurricane Camille hit about three months later. And I wasn't sure I'd made the right decision. What did Dorothy say about being she had, there? She had always talked about wanting to live on the coast, but she had some doubts after that was over. And we had a few trees down in the yard, but we didn't have any house damage. So that made it a lot simpler. But all the reports, we went to Natchez for that weekend, and all the reports said there was six feet of water in Pascagoula. We had just bought a house and didn't want to go back, but we didn't have any water. Oh, so we good. were like, it was more over toward Gulfport and Biloxi. And, when, and I, I understand you retired from... <laughs> From yeah. Ingalls. When did, when did you retire? I retired in 89 and uh, I went to work there in 69. We were just starting to build the West Bank shipyard. At that time there wasn't anything on the West Bank. Just the East Bank yard and you're familiar with that, I yeah. gather. So I uh, was put in charge to, to, of medical fire and safety. And we built a hospital on, ba on base, you recall uh -huh. seeing the uh -huh. hospital. Well, I was head in charge of that for when we opened and for quite some time. Well, I, I remember doing many fire watches when yeah, the, my that, ship was being built there. Yeah. Uh, so I understand that you helped uh, work on or re, recommission the USS Iowa. We had it come in for overhaul. For overhaul? Yes. 
at one point. And, and that was just kind of a, an extra deal, you might say, aside from our regular building contract. But uh, I thought it was really funny. They still had the teak wood decks uh -huh. on that ship. They took them all out and put steel back in. And of course, everybody had to get a piece of teak wood. But I didn't. I don't, you don't have a piece? I, no, I didn't, and I don't know why. I bet you regret that. Now, I do. Huh? Yeah, real good friend of mine got enough to make an end table out of you know, a coffee table. So it really? was really yeah. Where's that coffee table? Oh, I days? got no idea now. I'd but, like uh, to put my hands on that. <laughs> yeah, well, that would be great. So what was it like seeing such an <laughs> iconic World War II class destroyer? Yeah. At, um, Right outside. Well, it was a battleship. Now. A battleship. I'm sorry, that's a yeah. story. Of course, it's a battleship. Uh -huh. Right. But uh, one thing in particular that I noticed that they had a bathtub that was square, that was still on that ship, and that was for President Roosevelt when they had one of their prime meetings for him to take his bath, because as you know, he was handicapped. That's right. So, and it was still there. We had a lot of valves that we couldn't replace. So we went to Mobile, where they had the USS Alabama, mm -hmm. and we robbed practically every valve on it to put on our ship. Everything was available and still good. So that was a, an interesting thing, yeah. I and, bet. And, and the steel on the sub superstructure was like 12 inches thick. Yes, I heard So that. I can imagine, I don't know how it ever floated. Maybe. <laughs> did you ever get to see it out at sea or to? No, I didn't. Uh -uh. Never did get out with it. Uh, I did uh, make a trial run on a destroyer. Mm -hmm. And that's quite interesting too. But And I never knew how, did you ever work on one of the destroyers? Uh, no, I was it on a cruiser. A cruiser? Um, well, they were in the same thing really, the same close. class. Yeah. But I wondered what the top speed was. We never knew. Well, I think it's classified. Yeah, it, it, the only thing we knew was like 30 knots. Yeah, 30 plus. Yeah. But the thing that amazed me, and you can tell me if this is true, but we were on that ship that night, and then on the test run. We were going wide open, which was at that time about 30 knots. No lights, no running lights at all, everything pitch black. And all of a sudden, we start to turn to the left, but the ship leans to the right. And I would have sworn we would turn it to the right, leaning into the curve mm -hmm. instead of out of the curve. But is that? Yeah, that's, that's the way it happens. That's the way it happens. It, it is. It's kind it's, of it's counterintuitive. A, yeah. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about that in a long time, but you brought back some memories. I was trying to think about that. I got the fortune, uh, great fortune of doing exercises with the Iowa. Yeah. So we got to see those oh. guns go off. No kidding. Yeah. Oh, that's In the great. day and the night. Mm -hmm. That's something I'll never forget. I bet. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I put in a request to my son, who's still working down at, at Pascagoula. He works for DuPont, but he has an ex-Navy man working for him. And I told him I'd like him to find out how many ships that have, were built at Ingalls that are in the Navy right now. But I would almost bet that at least half the ships that are active right now were built on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. I wouldn't be surprised. The, It'll be interesting. To find my out. ship, the USS Yorktown, the second Ticonderoga class yeah. cruiser. Mm -hmm. um, I commissioned it, and then <clears throat> yeah. must be old because I went down to decommissioning. Oh, in, in at Ingalls. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that was something to see her in and see her out. Mm -hmm. Well, so, I, I, I first thing that I hit when I got <clears throat> there was we were building our last submarine, and it was nuclear. But that was the last one of those we built. And that was in the old shipyard. Fascinating. Well, that's a great history, and, and I'd like to bring you back in time a little bit because I, okay, um, you know, when I'd like to hear where you were and how did you hear about on V Day or, or Victory, um, especially for the Germans, and then mm -hmm. um, a number of months later in the, yeah. for, Jap for the Japanese. What we, was what were your recollections around that? We were in camp, and about we heard about five o'clock in the afternoon we got the announcement. And you were still in England. Yeah, and the camp went crazy. Yeah, everybody hollering and shouting and throwing their hats in the air, like you've seen so many times for celebrations. And then we all began to ask, wow, when are we going to get to go home? That was the we first question, out, right? We found out a little later, yes. Yeah. When that would be. 
And was the what were the uh, English people's reaction? I mean, was there a lot of you know celebration and parties and drinking and mm -hmm. all of that? Or there was quite a bit of celebration. I don't recall too much of the drinking and all. It was different. Mm -hmm. Now you don't recall because you were drunk, or don't? No, recall? I didn't drink. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I couldn't let that go. I, I think I was in the, over there for two years before I had my first beer. So, uh, Fascinating. Just, I, I got in that habit of playing high school football. It was better if you didn't. Not drink. And didn't smoke either way. Yeah. Well, I think it's done you well. You're in excellent shape. Well, thank you. Let's see if I've missed anything. Let me let me just kind of kick it to you. Uh, okay. What are your some of your best and maybe even your worst memories about your time in the service in, in those days? You mentioned the, the great story about the eggs. What's another <laughs> like thing that just makes you smile when you think about it? Uh, hmm. I was thinking about one of the bad moments. Okay, share that with me. Uh, when we got on, we had taking a train from San Antonio, Texas to Taunton, Massachusetts on a day coach. Four guys to the sea. For what purpose? To, to ship overseas. Oh, okay. That's where we caught our boat to go overseas at Taunton, Mass. And you talk about a filthy, dirty bunch of guys. It took several days for us to get there. And uh, went through, I can recall going through Chicago and seeing the stockyards. And that was a bad memory, yeah. But when we got there... So what smelled worse? The, <laughs> the guys or the stockyard? There'd be a toss-up. <laughs>